Jung was a very strange person and a visionary. And, and so he, that's kept him outside of the academic realm almost entirely. I mean, I was constantly warned as an undergraduate and then a graduate student and then a professor against ever talking about Jung in any way whatsoever. When I went on the job market when I was at McGill, when I had graduated from McGill, I had done my scientific research in, on alcoholism and I had a fairly lengthy publication record that was pure empirical research and, and really neurophysiological research um, into the pharmacology of alcoholism. And I had established a reasonably solid dossier of publications, but at the same time I was writing this book that became Maps of Meaning, and so I'd split my time in graduate student school between these two endeavors, one very specifically neurological and pharmacological and really biologically based, and the other very abstract, religious, symbolic, psychoanalytic, the complete opposite, but I could see that the two things overlapped really nicely, and there was a number of scientists at the time that were also drawing the same Conclusions, the same relationship between the biology and the psychoanalysis. Jak Panksepp, who wrote a book called Affective Neuroscience, which is a great classic, is, is one of those people who, who saw the relationship between the neurobiology of emotion and motivation and the psychoanalytic insights. Um, never became a mainstream view, but I think it's too complex. I think that the, bridging the gap between the biology and the, and the symbolic is too much for people, generally speaking. You know, it was certainly virtually too much for me because I got quite ill when I was a graduate student, I think, for a variety of reasons. I also, like, would go out and party three nights a week, and so that probably had something to do with it. But, <laughs> but working on those two things simultaneously was also rather exhausting. Now, Jung was a tremendously insightful clinician, and he was a strange person, introverted visionary, high in introversion, very, 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 very high in openness, like off the charts, and also God only knows what his IQ was. I mean, every time I read Jung, it's like reading Nietzsche. It's terrifying because, you know, he's, he's so damn smart that he can think up answers to questions that you don't even... It's not like you don't understand the answers. It's, you never conceptualize the damn questions. It's really something to read someone like that, right, who says, well, here's a mystery, and you think, wow, I never thought of that as a mystery, and here's the solution. It's like, okay, that's... That's, <laughs> that's something. You know, and he could read Greek, and he could read... He read all the ancient, he read a very large variety of ancient languages and was very familiar with the entire corpus of, of uh, astrological thought and of alchemical thought and of classic literature and biblical stories and, I mean, educated in a way that no one is educated now. And so he's a very daunting person to encounter and terrifying, absolutely terrifying. His book, Ion, which is the second volume of of, it's the second volume of Volume 9, which is The Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious. That damn book is just absolutely terrifying because Jung, he's one of these visionaries who can see way underneath the social structures and look at patterns that are developing across, for, in Jung's case, across thousands of years and lays them out. And so that's, a really, that's really something to, to encounter. Ion is a terrifying book. Um, anyways, one question might be, well, because I read Jung and I think, how the hell did he know these things? How could he figure these things out? I can't understand how he could possibly know these things. Well, here's a partial answer. Jung was a visionary, and so what that means, as far as I can tell, and I, we could do a little quick survey here. How many of you think you think in words? You can put up your hands. Do you think in words? Okay, so it looks like what about pictures? How many of you think in pictures? Okay, so that's interesting. How many of you think, that's about half and half, by the way, probably a fewer on the word side. How many of you think in pictures and words? Okay, and, and so, all right, so it was roughly a third in each category, but that's also something that I really haven't encountered any research on from the neuropsychological perspective. It's like, well, do you think in pictures or do you think in words? And, and is, is that actually a reliable distinction? I think I think in words most of the time. But I can think in pictures. Like if I'm trying to build something, I can think in pictures very almost instantaneously. But it isn't my natural mode of thinking. I'm hyperverbal, and so my natural mode of thinking is to think everything through in words. But I know my wife isn't like that. She thinks in images and then has to translate them into words. And so 
Anyways, Jung was very literate, and he could really think in words, but he could really think in images, also talking to my wife quite extensively, like her, the intensity of her visualization vastly exceeds mine. So, for example, if I close my eyes and I try to imagine the crowd in front of me, it's pretty low resolution and vague, and, and not brilliantly colored and, and vivid, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like I'm seeing through a glass darkly, let's say. I can't bring images to mind with, that, with spectacular clarity, but my wife is very good at that, and Jung seemed to be absolutely a genius at that kind of thinking. And he had a lot of visionaries in his family history as well, so I don't know to what degree there's a hereditary component of that, and I don't know to what degree that's actually like a neurological specialization. I, I presume it would be associated with the trait openness dis distinguishes itself, differentiates itself into interest in ideas and interest in aesthetics. And my suspicion are, is that the people who are more interested in aesthetics are the visionary types, the ones that think in images. Anyways, Jung could really think in images, and he could imagine beings. And I had a client once who was a lucid dreamer. And how many of you have had a lucid dream? So you know you're dreaming while, you, while you're, okay, many. That, that phenomena wasn't really even even identified as a phenomenon until the end of the 19th century. There was a book written about it that Freud tried to get his hands on, but couldn't, because it was a very rare book. And then there was a researcher about 30 years ago who started to study lucid dreams. But anyways, I had a client who was a lucid dreamer, and one of the things she could do was ask her dream characters what information they were trying to convey, and they would tell her. So that was very interesting. And one of the consequences of that was, and I don't have this story completely right in my memory, but it's close enough. She was afraid of a very large number of things. And in her dream, I think it was a gypsy standing by a wagon, told her that if she was going to be successful in university, that she would have to visit a slaughterhouse. And that was something that was way beyond her capacity to tolerate. She was a vegetarian, she couldn't stand the sight of raw meat even. And so, and she was very oppressed and depressed and anxious because of the slaughterhouse nature of existence. And so her dream focused on that and one of the consequences of that, because the slaughterhouse was out of the question as a clinical intervention, um, I took her to an embalming. Right, because I asked her, I asked her what, what what might be equivalent to that, and so she suggested that. And, you know, exposure therapy is a hallmark of clinical psychology, right? One of the things you do with people as a clinician is you find out what they're afraid of, and you gradually and voluntarily expose them to that, and that cures them. And that's associated with the hero myth, right? It's exactly the same thing. It's like, there's a dragon, and it's stopping you, because there's lots of dragons, most of them aren't stopping you. You can ignore them. You don't have to just go, you know, slash away at randomly, you're not supposed to be fighting dragons that aren't in your way. But if they are in your way, you can't ignore them, and then you decompose them into sub-dragons, and you have people, you know, take them on. And as they take them on, they dispense with the dragon, and they gain the power of the dragon. It's like a video game. Uh, actually, a video game is like that. That's why people like the video games. Well, that's right, right? There's a reason that you absorb power when you overcome things when you play a video game. It's not like that's intrinsic to the video game structure. That's an archetypal idea. Anyways, we went and saw an embalming, which was a very interesting experience and, and quite, quite useful for her because she knew what she could tolerate after that. And it was a hell of a lot more than she thought she could tolerate. And so that's very useful to know.